Hey there, welcome back to our little YouTube channel for South Point Community Church. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that I get to be here after uh, 12 days of uh, of maybe passing a kidney stone. Um, I am pleased to report that I am still alive and uh, PowerPoint Dave can uh, uh, take a well-deserved break and Pastor Dave, I guess, is uh, back in action uh, here on our, our trusty little bench. I'm so, uh, I'm so, I'm so blessed, um, to be completely honest. I'm blessed to have a wonderful family who, uh, uh, through thick and thin, uh, cared for me. Uh, I'm blessed to have, uh, friends and, and church members and just, uh, so many, uh, people sending me little notes of encouragement and so on and so on. Um, and I'm blessed to live in a country where there's, Free healthcare, uh, free healthcare with, uh, experts, uh, who are definitely caring and definitely competent. And even under the stress and duress of, uh, COVID-19, uh, treated me, uh, in, in a, uh, in a, just a way that's second to none. And, and I'm so, so very grateful for all of our healthcare people right now. And so if I could, uh, um, start us off with a little bit of a prayer um i'd be happy to do that and uh and then i want to share uh our song that's kind of going to be our theme song today uh it is well with my soul it is well with my soul really 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 powerful um older hymn uh that has a story behind it and uh and fits so well today with our passage of scripture that we want to dive into but let's pray Gracious Father, we are so, we are so blessed. Uh, we're so blessed to be able to come into your presence at this very moment. Uh, here, there, everywhere, um, on a smart device of any kind, um, and immediately turn our, um, circumstances and turn our attention and turn our particular, um, space into a sanctuary. Um, because you are present in that space. You are present with us. Um, you are working on our behalf. And, and you continue, Lord, um, to sit on your throne, um, not idly, um, but intentionally, moving and shaping and helping um, your people. And we just are so very, very, very confident in you um, and in your plan. And even though we don't always understand all the details, um, we get to proclaim, it is well with my soul. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Hey, well, here's Laura um, doing uh, uh, just very brief rendition of it is well with my soul. And, uh, and if you listen to these words, and I mean really listen to them, um, they will lift your spirits, I promise. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows just has rocked my world this week and it's uh it, it's really been fascinating journey for me uh spending a little time passing a kidney stone sorry for bringing it up again and then um and then and then looking intently at paul's letter to the philippians and him working through his struggles um and yet choosing joy 
And then we come to this song. It is well with my soul. Um, there's a story behind the song. It's an incredible story. And it, and, and, and in some ways, um, it's not just a story worth telling, um, but it's a story that's repeated over and over and over again in a consistent way throughout Christian history um, that, that, that's just remarkable. So the gentleman who wrote the song, um, his name was Horatio Spafford, and, um, and he was a lawyer in Chicago. He writes the song, after after so much tragedy had just compounded and compounded in his life. In 1871, he lost his four-year-old son um, in the Chicago fire, the great Chicago fire. And he also lost a ton of real estate in that fire. He was a wonderful Christian man. Uh, he was a lawyer. I know there's jokes. Um, but, um, but he had been fairly successful in his practice and invested heavily in re real estate right where the Chicago fire just destroyed everything. Two years later, he's, he's working through this rebuild process. It's difficult economic times for everybody in Chicago. Um, his family has planned a trip to Europe. And, um, and he's not able to join them. He's going to join them, uh, but he has to send his wife and four daughters ahead. The ship on its way to England in 1873 um, is involved in a collision and, uh, and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. He gets this now famous telegram from his wife, Anne, which reads, Saved alone, dot, dot, dot. She survives the, the, the shipwreck um, and yet loses her four daughters and is engulfed in this grief where she is completely alone on the other side of the globe. And so immediately, of course, he boards the next available ship and heads to England um, to meet his grieving wife. When does he write this song? It is well with my soul. When does he pen this verse? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, when sorrows, sorrows, great sorrows, like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. He writes it as the ship that he is on is passing the location of the ship where his daughters had drowned. It is well with my soul, <clears throat> not because uh, everything is, is roses. Um, in the next verse, and there's actually six verses to the song, and so I'm just going to um, uh, put a, a couple of YouTube links if you'd like to look at the song a little bit more. Um, Audrey has said there's a beautiful uh, version of it. It's, uh, it's four minutes long. Um, if you want to get your country on, uh, Paul Brandt um, does a, a fantastic uh, um, uh, copy of it, and, and that's six minutes long, so he includes a few more of the six verses and uh and both are really really um encouraging and uplifting um as uh, as as just life brings these challenges and 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 we have to find a way to say it is well with my soul um we have to find a confidence i love this one little quote i stole from uh max lucado in our uh in our bible study on philippians he says uh, stabilize your soul with the sovereignty of God. Stabilize your soul with the sovereignty of God. And that's what this song is about. That's what our scripture passage happens to be about. So I'm going to read our scripture passage. Uh, I'm going to get a little crazy. I'm going to read it from the New American Standard Bible. 
Um, there's lots of English translations and people kind of get frustrated. Why does there have to be so many translations? Well, when you're translating from another language, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can do it in sort of a strict wooden uh, fashion, translating word for word, or you can do it in what's called a dynamic fashion, uh, making the effort to not just translate the words, but also to translate more of the meaning, the meaning, sorry, for a modern audience, because language develops and changes over time, and so that's why there's so many translations. Um, in the in in this passage of scripture, when you read it from the New American Standard Bible, they've just taken the words in the Greek and plunked them there um, in in English, and so you run into some old words. Uh, for example, we're going to see here in um, in verse in verse thirteen that Paul is with the Praetorian Guard. Now, modern translator would translate that royal guard or imperial guard um, because we don't use the word Praetorian a lot. Um, however, uh, it is a word, and um, and there is this opportunity to 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 discover a new word and and look it up. In fact, Google uh, makes this incredibly easy. And so uh, I want to read it uh, for you just so that we get how significant the sovereignty of God really is and how it works out in the Apostle Paul's life. This is what he says, starting at verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and this I will rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Paul's experience was that the sovereignty of God stabilized his life, his soul, and his perspective. Horatio, in the midst of terrible grief, his experience was that the stability for his soul came from knowing that a sovereign God was caring for his children and even his very alone wife. It's a common story. It's a wonderful story. And I'd just like to take a moment uh, to hopefully encourage you by letting you hear um, Katie's story. Many of you know Katie as Dr. Uh, McDowell. She does a great job over at the vet clinic and, um, and, and some of you just know her as little curly haired Katie, uh, but she's got a good story. So I hope this is encourages you. Hello everyone, my South Point family, uh, missing you all very much. I hope you're all uh, staying safe and uh, just staying strong uh, through these difficult times, strange times. Um, so uh, the sermon this weekend is about uh, triumph and trouble. And uh, Tracy and Dave asked me just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the experiences in my life. Um, a time in my life when I knew that God was in control. I didn't exactly know what his plan was, uh, but even in a difficult time, I knew that uh, uh, he had a plan for me. 
So some of you have heard this story before, I, uh, so you, uh, it might be a little bit repetitive, but it's a story that I like to tell um, because it's often um, a time in my life that I reflect on uh, when I need strength uh, in the present time. I can look back and say, you know, there was a time in my life when things were really hard and I kept the faith and, uh, and it turned out for the best. So if we rewind to about 2006 and um, I have just been rejected uh, from vet school and uh, so that was a big blow to my ego um, just trying to do what it is that I want to do with my life and um, uh, the, the path that I took was to um, do some more schooling get a master's they said uh, you'll have a better chance of getting into vet school they said uh, well it turns out that um, I chose a supervisor that was incredibly difficult to work with uh, so um, for about a year uh, trying to work on a master's degree uh, after graduating from university um, I found myself working for somebody who um, was very condescending uh, you know um, people who just like to yell a lot and yell all the time and I'm not really good um, with things like that and even 10 or 15 years ago um, I think I didn't have uh, the thick skin that I have now and so it was really difficult um, and I just remember every day lying in my bed and um, just praying because I had to go in and I had to work my experiments weren't working um, my supervisor was getting frustrated with me uh, I just felt like I was doing everything that she asked me to do and things still weren't working out and um, so that was 2006 and uh, fast forward a little bit about six or eight months uh, into my master's program and things are not going well uh, it's actually not good and it was to the point where my supervisor said to me I don't think this is going to work out I think you need to um, stop working here basically and find something else to do and that was really devastating for me. I, I remember after leaving her office, just going back to my student office, and it was late at night. I was the only one there, uh, and I was in tears. Um, I cannot remember any other time in my life that I really felt that lost and uh, maybe misguided or just like, God, like, what am I doing with my life? You know, I spent close to six months, nine months, um, just praying every day, uh, going into work, uh, getting yelled at, uh, being felt like I wasn't good enough, um, being humiliated, uh, even in front of uh, other lab people that were working, um, and just not giving up. And I, I look back on that because I'm like, man, that was, man, I didn't give up then. So if I'm going through something now, don't give up now. Um, God was in that low place and most of you obviously know that I'm a vet now and um, but God was with me there and I feel like he had to take me into that journey um, I had to go through a lot of those things because looking back I can say he was um, working on my character um, I think I needed a little bit of humility, so uh, it was good that uh, I was experiencing that. But that was a really low place for me. I really didn't know um, what I was supposed to do or where I was supposed to go. And I just remember sitting at my computer, um, just being so lost. And then this little voice that said to me, um, remember the Atlantic Bridge program. Remember your grade 10 high school math teacher and remember that he had a son that couldn't get into vet school here in Canada and he went overseas and the program was called the Atlantic Bridge program and I can remember Mr. Lee talking to me about this I remember him uh, uh, kind of chewing on the back of uh, one of his glasses or a pen or something as he's talking to me um, and then I didn't think about it again for like 15 years. So 
Uh, it just really blows my mind that in that really low point, um, something outside of me um, said into me, you know, Atlantic Bridge Program, look into it. Um, so in that really, really low day that I had, I left my student office not in tears, but um, with some hope. And I, long story short, I Googled Atlantic Bridge Program. I realized that I had a deadline of less than two months away. I needed to get reference letters together. I needed to get an application together. And um, the rest is history. I ended up going to Ireland uh, for five years. It was an incredible time in my life. Uh, um, really expensive, but that's okay. It's worth it. Um, but hey, you know, um, we got through it. And here I am today doing what I love, taking care of animals and, uh, and working with my dad, uh, which um, I sometimes love, but not always. A lot of you probably uh, know that because I complain a lot sometimes about it. Um, so God is there with us. And, um, you know, I didn't know at the time what his plan was, but it was an incredible plan. And it was so much more fun, amazing, um, enriching for my life than anything that I could have ever imagined or planned for myself. So I can look back uh, on that low point in my life uh, just before uh, going off to vet school. And um, so again, this is uh, something that I like to talk about. I, you know, anyone that ever wants to hear my story, uh, I love to share it with them. And uh, I'm very quick to say that it was uh, God's work uh, behind the scenes, um, almost covering me with his wings. And it was when, um, you know, uh, he revealed to me what his plan was, that it was just so amazing and exciting for my life. So I hope that answers the question. I hope I didn't uh, ramble too much. Uh, I will say that I did get to see Mr. Lee. Uh, there's a few kids in our uh, church congregation that were doing um, plays out of the Wheatley Baptist uh, Church, and uh, I went to watch some of the kids uh, one year. And didn't I get to sit in the same row with Mr. Lee? And uh, I did not hesitate uh, to tell him that um, he had a big part in uh, where I was. And I also slipped in that uh, I believed that it was God's plan for my life. So, um, yeah, it was nice to get to, to share that with him. I hope you're all doing well. I miss you all so much. Um, this has been such an interesting uh, last couple of months. And uh, I hope that you're all staying safe uh, and living, um, living your life fully uh, and not so much in fear. Uh, just be brave and be smart. Be thankful for um, the, the, the people that we have that are studying this virus and, um, uh, and hopefully it will be done soon and we can all hug each other again and uh, spread lots of germs that hopefully uh, are not coronavirus related. God bless you all. Miss you. Take care. Mwah. Thank you, Katie. That, that really does encourage me um, because I know that God is working, and often just not the way you expect Him to be working. And that's amazing. Listen, we, uh, we need to take a rabbit trail. Here we go. Everybody knows who these little guys in their white armor are. They're the worst shots in the galaxy. Um, they're known in the Star Wars universe as stormtroopers. But I'm not sure everybody knows who these red guys are. And in our last uh, uh, movie from, from the Star Wars saga, uh, Rise of Skywalker, of course, they're very prominent. So do, who do they happen to be? Well, they are the Praetorian Guard. And, uh, and Mr. Star Wars, whoever that might be, didn't just come up with that phrase. Uh, he uh, he stole it. They're the Imperial Guard. They're the uh, Emperor's Guard. The Praetorian Guard is the ones who stand around the throne room as the elite 
soldiers that protect the emperor. And so, uh, so in the Apostle Paul's case, um, you notice where uh, he talks about the Praetorian Guard in uh, chapter 1 here, verse 13, that it's become known to the Praetorian Guard that the Apostle Paul himself is there for the cause of Christ and to everyone else. The Praetorian Guard were uh, in the palace, of course, um, with the Roman Emperor, and their job is so important um, that they're given six-hour shifts um, because they need to be 110% alert at all times. So it's four six-hour shifts throughout the day. So the Apostle Paul, in his imprisonment there for um, two to three years, has the opportunity, as he's chained and unchained and rechained to guard after guard after guard every six hours to witness to thousands, well, maybe not thousands of guards, but but to all of these guards thousands of times. And, uh, and he's exactly the kind of guy who does it. He, he realizes that his imprisonment isn't because God isn't doing a good job spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. His desire, right from the beginning of the book of Acts, is, is repeatedly declared that he wants to come to Rome. He wants to come to Rome. He wants to come to Rome. He wanted, of course, to come to Rome um, as, as a pastor, as a preacher, as an evangelist. Um, and instead, um, God gives him this uh, opportunity to go there as a prisoner, a political prisoner. It's fascinating um, on a couple of accounts, but one is that when you finally get to the end of the book of Philippians, and Paul is now uh, sharing his, his final greetings, this is what he says. He says, Greet all the saints. This is chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. So uh, Epaphrodites, Timothy, uh, Titus, all those guys that are hanging out, Luke, whoever happens to be there um, that uh, are common friends, they all send their greetings. All the saints, so all the Christians in Rome um, send you greetings, especially who? especially those who belong to Caesar's household. God gave the Apostle Paul chains. He gave him hardship. And yet, because Paul's soul was stabilized by his respect, appreciation, and understanding of the sovereignty of God, he was able to wait his time, trust God, and see many, many, many in the household of Caesar himself come to faith in Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are, we are so abundantly blessed and so very, very, very thankful that we have a God like you, who is not far away, who is always present, always working, who knows and who cares. And as we turn over our struggles to you, as we surrender um, and trust you, Lord, we want to look with eyes of faith to see what you are doing and to marvel at your goodness and your kindness and your faithfulness. And so in advance, Lord, we thank you for it all. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. God bless you, and thank you.